Okay, and hopefully we should be live. Is it working? Is it working? Okay. And yes, it seems to be working. Okay, colleagues. So today, as always, a very special class. Um, every class is special in its own right. Uh, today's class is doubly special because I'm incidentally going to talk about two of my favorite ancient philosophers. You'd think, you know, Plato, Aristotle, but no. My favorites are Epicurus and Sextus Empiricus. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about both tonight. So, uh, without further ado, so I've decided to slightly rename the lecture. Um, I, call it, I call it Epicurus and the Hellenistic Age. So, but of all the philosophies of the Hellenistic age, I want to focus on the Epicurus and the Epicurean tradition. Mm. So let me start. Let me start um, uh, chronologically, you know, with a little bit, with a little bit of a historical background, just a little bit. So we are talking about the Hellenistic age. Now, um, this is a period in history. So Hellenistic comes from the Greek word Hellas, Hellas, which means Greece. So the Hellenistic age is the age of Greece, or more specifically of the Greek culture, Greek language, spreading all throughout the Mediterranean. And the Hellenistic age is supposed to, uh, uh, well, I mean, obviously these are uh, historical conventions, so uh, different historians will divide the time period differently. But one uh, traditional way to talk about this is uh, uh, to start at the death of Alexander the Great, um, to the ascension of Emperor Augustus. Uh, so this would be approximately from 333 uh, uh, BCE to um, 30 BCE, to, uh, to the Battle of Actium, when the forces of uh, uh, Octavian, who will, you know, the nephew and adopted son of Caesar, uh, who will defeat Mark Anthony and then become the Roman emperor, right? Mm. And so, uh, and this period is going to be followed then historically by um, so-called Pax Romana, the Roman peace. So if you want, you can think about this as the period of Greek wars followed by Roman peace. Greek wars followed by Roman peace. And um, in the aftermath of uh, conquest of Alexander the Great, we have uh, the so-called Hellenization of the Mediterranean. So Alexander has a conscious um, cultural policy. He's trying to spread Greek language, but also Greek cultural practices. And... Uh, this creates um, you know, a lot of very interesting um, uh, consequences. Um, most, most consequences are uh, uh, chaotic in the sense that this is a period of both intellectual chaos and political chaos. Uh, but at the so and, and I mean, uh, Alexander the Great creates the uh, conditions for the spread of um, Greek language, and Greek language basically becomes the lingua franca of the Mediterranean. And this, incidentally, also creates uh, a large deal of intellectual chaos, because I would imagine that the first uh, consequence of this exchange of ideas is uh, widespread uh, skepticism, relativism, and in general uncertainty. And we have the proliferation of various uh, uh, cults, superstitions, um, you know, all sorts of new religions. Astrology comes to the fore. The worship of the traditional gods, um, you know, is called into question. And, uh, um, you know, these kinds of practices, which are usually referred to as syncretism, syncretism, mm -hmm. when religions um, get mixed together. So um, let me, um, well, this is, this is the map. This is the map of the uh, Mediterranean and the Middle East um, right after the conquests of Alexander, because, as you know, Alexander died very young. And so immediately after he died, uh, his um, followers, the so-called diadochi, uh, became, uh, sorry, began the scramble for power. And you have, uh, <laughs> right after, the, after Alexander's death, this um, civil war that basically continues on and on. I don't want to say civil war, but just a period of war, tremendous war and chaos, continuing up until uh, uh, the Romans conquer the Mediterranean and reestablish um, some sort of stability, which again will be known as Pax Romana. Okay, so this map is not really all that important, and this map keeps changing immediately. The two most important kingdoms are going to be the Seleucid um, uh, Syria 
well, not just Syria, you know, I, I would suppose. Well, anyway, so yeah, the Seleucid Syria and the Ptolemaic Egypt, these would be the two most important ones, although this is not important for our course. Um, yeah, in, in philosophy, in philosophy, when we talk about the Hellenistic age, um, we, we usually continue forward, right? Because uh, um, even, even after the Roman peace is established, so philosophers such as Marcus Aurelius, uh, who writes in the year 180 CE, or I'm going to talk today about Sextus Empiricus. Sextus Empiricus dies in, 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 two, in, um, in 210 CE, or Plotinus dies in 270. And um, basically, I would say that sort of from the standpoint of chronology, the Hellenistic philosophies really end with the beginning of the Middle Ages. So, and, and then we talk about religious philosophies, uh, Christian, Jewish, and Islamic religion, religious philosophies of the Middle Ages. But um, basically everything between Aristotle and the Middle Ages could be considered as Hellenistic. Uh, Neoplatonists are in this weird position you know, sometimes they, they're counted, sometimes they're not. But, you know, these uh, divisions are not, not really all that important. So, um, just um, for the context, so these are, these are the dates of the major philosophers. Um, so, what is sort of important, I guess, what I want to draw out on the slide, is that um, the important philosophers we're going to talk about today uh, especially Diogenes, uh, Pyrrho, and Epicurus, they are all approximately contemporary with Aristotle. Uh, Epic Epicurus is a younger contemporary of Aristotle. So even though, you know, in the minds of historians of philosophy, there's this sharp divide between Plato and Aristotle on the one hand and the Hellenistic schools, which are supposed to have, you know, come later, as a matter of fact, they all write approximately simultaneously. Anyway... It's another way to arrange the chronology. Well, uh, I'll post the slides later if you want to take a look at this. Anyway, so um, I'm, I've already started talking about the characteristics of the period, and I think we have to be um, aware of a couple of things. So on the one hand, on the one hand, we can see the philosophies that we're going to talk about in a second as uh, outgrowths of the particular historical period in which they were created. So again, I've already mentioned um, uh, political and intellectual chaos, and the simplest characterization of the philosophies of the Hellenistic age would go something like this. The world is bad, let us learn to be independent of it. The world is bad, let us learn to be independent of it. And you can, you can um, see them as outgrowths of, again, particular historical circumstances and even try to maybe reduce these philosophies to particular historical circumstances. But I think that this does not really do them justice. As a matter of fact, I think that these philosophies, again, cynicism, stoicism, epicureanism, and skepticism have universal significance even for us today. These are the philosophies that are going to try to, to, to speak to the individual, to the concerns of the individual. They're very much going to be uh, concerned with the question of how can I be happy as an individual? Again, you see for both Plato and Aristotle, this question had a very um, important political ring, uh, especially for Aristotle. You can only be happy in a well-ordered society. And these four schools are going, to, are going to be asking, but what if you are not living in a well-ordered society? Can you still be happy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is this is going to be the question that preoccupies us. And again, I urge you, I urge you to not reduce these schools to this simplistic formulation. Anyway, so uh, um, I I finished I was finishing uh, last class on Aristotle by talking about this sort of uh, pro and contra, right? Uh, um, so what later political tradition is going to take from Aristotle is this idea of man as a political animal that in order to be happy, we need to be uh, members of a political society. Now, in general, in general, later political tradition, again, people like Karl Marx or people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau or even Hegel to some extent, they, they will take this view from, uh, from Aristotle. However, um, the Hellenistic schools will all be uh, deeply pessimistic about this prospect, because, basically because political participation was more or less impossible for, uh, in, in the Hellenistic age. And after the Hellenistic age, after the Greek wars are over and the Roman peace is established, still within the Roman Empire, the, the imperial politics are dominated <laughs> by, the, by the emperor right? and, and his court. So uh, political participation is very much limited even, even after the war is over and peace is established. 
Mm. But still, 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 this idea of, uh, you know, man is benefiting from living in a community, we will see something like that in Epicureans today. Um, the, big, the big question about Aristotle, though, so the big contra, uh, uh, the big uh, criticism of Aristotle is going to be his teleological view of nature, this idea that nature is uh, intrinsically orderly. Now, the Neoplatonists and the Stoics are going to be um, allied to Aristotle on this issue. So the, the Stoics especially will see the world as a providential place, but the Epicureans, especially the Epicureans, and I suppose the skeptics too, but especially the Epicureans will not. And again, um, broadly speaking, after the Renaissance the, um, and the scientific revolution, the pendulum will swing in the opposite direction and Aristotle will fall out of favor big time. Aristotle, again, for, for figures such as Hobbes, for example, Aristotle represents everything that is wrong with philosophy, with this idealistic, uh, wishful thinking, teleological approach. Uh, uh, the, the new mechanistic science is going to re repudiate that. Again, this idea of the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter. But anyway, let me, let me go back to the Hellenists. So again, I mentioned this already. So we have the political chaos, the wars, the uncertainty, and the subjection, the subordination of the independent city-state. So the polis is, is, I don't want to say it's destroyed, but it's, it, it becomes subordinate. So you don't have this, again, Aristotelian ideal of taking turns, ruling and being ruled, almost, almost, never, uh, uh, almost nowhere in the Mediterranean. You are ruled by kings or princes, and eventually everybody is ruled by the Roman emperor. So there's no taking turns ruling and being ruled. And, and the polis maybe have some uh, a local residual autonomy, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing anymore. Okay, okay. And likewise, we also have this ideological chaos uh, uh, because, again, ideas, uh, <laughs> exchange of ideas leads to relativism and skepticism. People realize that, uh, you know, the Olympian gods are only one way to look at the world, and there's all sorts of other religions, all sorts of other ideas floating around. And again, especially again, this syncretism, which means mixture of religions, but also mysticism, various cults, astrology. There's a, uh, a small uh, Jewish sect which appears at this time and over the years slowly but steadily grows out of all proportion to become <laughs> the Ro eventually become the Roman Christianity. Again, against the background of this ideological chaos, this, um, you know, if we had more classes, we'd have a, a whole class on, on Christianity. Christianity kind of falls uh, in many ways into the uh, same basic intellectual background and same basic intellectual outlook. You can see a lot of similarities between Christianity and other philosophies that we're going to talk about today. Differences too, but also similarities. Okay, so yeah, and in general, so all of the philosophies of, of this time are, are looking for salvation. Again, especially private individual salvation. How can I be happy in the world of total chaos? How, how can I find salvation amidst this, all of this chaos? Mm. And you get religions of salvation, such as Christianity, for example, but also many others, like uh, cult of, uh, cult of uh, Mithra, for example. Um, but also in philosophy, especially this search for ataraxia, ataraxia, this word I kept talking about, ataraxia, which means free, uh, literally means freedom from disturbance, freedom from uh, perturbation, freedom from violent passions. Mm. And especially in philosophy, um, we will see the paradigmatic virtue of sort of self-control. How can, how can I control myself in order to guarantee some kind of psychological comfort against the, the chaos of the external world. And uh, as a matter of fact, these philosophies, especially because the political world is breaking down, are usually going to address individuals simply as an individual, simply as a human being. And therefore, I would say, as far as I can tell, all four philosophies have a deeply, deeply cosmopolitan outlook. You know, for the Epicureans, the skeptics, the Stoics, and the Cynics, everybody is just a human being. We are all essentially simply humans. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Roman or a Phoenician or a Persian or a Greek, it doesn't matter. We all live in the same chaotic world. We're all faced with the same problems. And the solution that these philosophies are going to offer are going to be broadly speaking similar. And again, so we have this idea of uh, philosophy as, th as therapy, therapy. So philosophy is therapeutic. Philosophy should be to the soul what medicine is to the body, right? 
And uh, 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 again, in addition to ataraxia, there's a whole bunch of other words which get thrown around. So ataraxia in Greek means freedom from disturbance. There's another word, aponia, which means freedom from pain. Um, those of you who will read uh, Rousseau carefully, especially my second year students, um, uh, Rousseau actually uses this word in its Latin form, in indolence, indolence, indolentia, which is a translation of the Greek word aponia, freedom from pain which is uh, um, this Rousseauian ideal of this natural man, the noble savage. This is what the natural man strives for. Indolence, aponia, which is broadly speaking synonymous to ataraxia. Another word that can be used in this context is apatheia, apatheia. Uh, it's cognate to English word apathy, but means something different. So apathy is supposed to be this <laughs> negative melancholic mood, whereas apatheia in Greek is something positive. Again, freedom from passions. The, uh, the um, connotation for all of these words is something like serenity, tranquility, calmness, calmness. Uh, some people may hear certain um, parallels to the Greek, uh, sorry, to the uh, Sanskrit word nirvana, nirvana. And I think, it, I think it, broadly speaking, it's an appropriate uh, metaphor. Um, another another uh, um, word that we will meet is this metriopatheia, which means moderations of passions. And uh, euthymia, which, which is a word from Democritus, which means gladness or ser serenity. Again, I'm just I'm throwing these words around. Uh, these are different words for, broadly speaking, more or less the same thing. Different philosophers are going to uh, concentrate on, on different uh, uh, words, but the, the main idea is the same. All of these words are synonymous. Okay. So, uh, and I would like to begin um, with our first philosopher, who is uh, Diogenes, Diogenes of Sinope, the one who lived in a wine jar. And uh, uh, in a certain important sense, Diogenes, I think, is a, 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 is a very nice uh, character to summarize the basic outlook of, the, of, the, of all four Hellenistic philosophies. Well, to some extent, to some extent. There, there's going to be differences, obviously. Uh, now, Diogenes, strictly speaking, is supposed to be the founder or, or co-founder co of cynicism. Uh, and um, cynicism comes from the Greek word kunos, which means dog. Uh, there are alternative uh, hypotheses of where the name originates, but this one gets most traction these days. Uh, um, and um, again, for Diogenes, um, the idea is, again, that you, the, the chief value is freedom, independence, self-control, autonomy, again, moderation of passions, and very much this idea of nature versus convention, again, thesis versus nomos, this idea that you want to uh, throw out all the rules of society, that in general society uh, does not make us happy, society does not uh, uh, give us uh, uh, anything useful. In fact, uh, um, there's a wonderful um, quote from, sex, uh, sorry, from, from Epicurus, which I plan to talk about, again, sort of, we must free ourselves from the prison of public education and politics. And uh, uh, so even, even, though, even though this is a quote from uh, 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 Epi uh, Epicurus, it's, I, think it's, I think it's broadly speaking similar in outlook, so Epicurus. So these, these philosophies they have, especially, especially cynicism, uh, uh, has this somewhat antisocial nature. Uh, again, this, this idea that, uh, uh, I already mentioned this, right? right? Um, and in the dialogue Alcibiades, Socrates tells to Alcibiades that the first task of education is to unlearn all the um, useless and harmful things that society has taught us. Anyway, um, and so Diogenes, again, this idea of natural, uh, going back to nature, again, broadly speaking, similar in outlook to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, foreshadowing many themes in Rousseau. So this idea that sort of you don't need clothing, you don't need fancy things, you don't need material possessions. Again, Diogenes lives like a dog. He lives in the street. He lives in an empty wine jar. He lives by begging, just, you know, finding, you know, scraps of food. And uh, especially sort of, uh, you know, some people give him candy and he throws candy, you know, what kind of ancient candy they had, you try to imagine. He throws it away, saying, away with a tyrant, because, you know, you shouldn't be accustomed to luxurious food. You know, be as independent as possible. Again, this notion of he is not rich who has much, but he is rich who needs little. Therefore, do not get accustomed to luxurious food. You know, get accustomed to a simple diet. That way you need little and you can be happy with little. And it makes a lot of sense, I think, right? So if you are hungry, even very basic food uh, uh, tastes good. It tastes like a feast. So again, this idea, um, he is not rich who has much, but he is rich who has little. Sorry, he is uh, not rich who has much, but he is rich who needs, needs little, right? 
And uh, uh, to sort of summarize uh, <laughs> this uh, wonderful story about Diogenes and Alexander, right? Diogenes and Alexander. So possibly taking place in Corinth, although who knows, right? So this is a story from Plutarch. So uh, Alexander uh, hears about this wonderful man, Diogenes, uh, uh, and uh, comes to greet him, right? You know, he comes with all of his guards, uh, uh, um, curious to see what, 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 what this person, what, what the whole fuss is about this person, Diogenes, right? And he asks, he, say, he tells uh, Diogenes, hi, say, hi, Diogenes, I am Alexander the Great, the ruler of the known world. Uh -huh. I am the king of the world, Alexander. What, is there anything I can do for you, Diogenes? Uh, and Diogenes uh, allegedly responds, he says, uh, hi, Alexander. And I am Diogenes, the dog, right? And to this uh, <laughs> second question, what can I do for you? Uh, Diogenes says, yeah, you, you, you can do something uh, 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 for me, Alexander. And uh, um, this is a quote, a translation from Greek, but I will translate so that modern day students can understand. Diogenes says, Alexander, would you be so kind and go fuck yourself? This is basically what Diogenes tells to Alexander. I mean, the, the ancient Greek says, stand out of my light. You're blocking the sun. Get out, get out of my sun. This is what he says. But you got to understand, the, the ultimate meaning is that Diogenes wants nothing to do with Alexander. He, 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 he tells him to take a hike. He's not interested in anything Alexander has to offer. Right? Alexander cannot harm him. And also, Alexander cannot really do anything for him. And you see, this, again, this, these notions of uh, self-control and moderation, the, 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 the notion of like this extreme autonomy, right? And it, it is impressive. And according to Plutarch, according, according to Plutarch, what Alexander says is, truly, if I were not Alexander, I wish I was Diogenes, right? So, and you got to understand why the sentiment. Now, of course, Alexander prefers to be himself, the king of the world, but if he were not, if he were not the king of the world, then Diogen being Diogenes is the next best thing. And that's, you know, that's a very tall order, right? That's a, that's a very high praise. If Alexander actually said that, although, <laughs> as you can imagine, there were no cameras back in the day. Uh, but um, mm, the, the, basic, the basic idea is that uh, uh, only one person can be Alexander. There's only one place for the king of the world. But Diogenes, everybody can be Diogenes. So again, as, as a... Um, uh, in terms of this uh, answer to the question of this political and intellectual chaos, Diogenes gives a certain answer. Now, um, some people try to uh, expound cynical philosophy as a systematic uh, enterprise, and th this is problematic for many reasons because uh, true cynics never wrote anything, right? So we don't really have any, I mean, we have writings surviving from later cynic philosophers, but you, you gotta ask yourself this question sort of. If, if you live like a dog in the street, would you write anything? So it's like um, uh, uh, um, elements of cynical insights will be incorporated later on in uh, Stoicism, for example. Um, but sort of that's the general idea. I, I should also mention that uh, you may see some similarities between Diogenes and Socrates. Diogenes considered himself to be the follower of Socrates. And so, so both Diogenes and so, so the cynics in general considered Socrates as their important uh, founder or forefather, and uh, likewise the cynics, the cynics, uh, sorry, not the cynics, but the Stoics, trace their lineage also back to Socrates, again, with these ideas of um, uh, self-rule, this autonomy, and, um, well, ataraxia to some extent, too. Again, um, I'm planning to maybe read tomorrow portions of the dialogue uh, Gorgias, where uh, this famous exchange between Socrates and Callicles, Socrates expresses some of these, uh, some of some of very similar um, ideas, similar to um, what we see in um, Diogenes, but also what we'll see in Epicurus. Okay, so again, so again, so this is the quote: "He is not rich who has much, but he is rich who needs little." Now, unfortunately, <laughs> in this wonderful form, I haven't been able to find it in ancient sources. Uh, so there are several quotes from 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 many different philosophers, which sound similar from Socrates, from Seneca, um, from Epicurus, and we're going to talk about Epicurus in a second. The way Epicurus phrases it is: He says, "If you wish to make a particular person wealthy, right? If you wish to make a person wealthy, don't give them more money, but rather reduce their desires." So this is again 
uh, he's not rich who has much. This is, this is my own rendition of this ancient phrase. So I, I, I promised that I wanted uh, the focus of this lecture to be an Epicurus. So let me begin with Epicurus. Um, so 341 to 270 BC, before the Common Era. Uh, now, also, let me mention, um, um, in general, I think the shortest and the best introduction to, Epicure to P Epicureanism, which I know of to date, is the article on the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. There's, there's many different resources on Epicureanism, but this one, this one is, I think, the most accessible. So, especially those of you who are going to be doing presentations, I uh, gladly direct you to that. Okay, okay. Now, also, <laughs> going to do something... Uh, um, uh, controversial, but let's 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 have a quote from some someone more modern to introduce the Epicureans. This is a quote actually from Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson says, "I too am an Epicurean." Jefferson says, "I consider the genuine, not the mistakenly attributed, but the genuine doctrines of Epicurus as containing everything, everything rational in moral philosophy which Greece and Rome has left us." Wow, that's a very tall order coming from Jefferson. Uh, right. So what what the whole what's the whole fuss is about, right? And so when I when I when I say that Epicurus is my a favorite ancient Greek philosopher, I'm in good company. I'm in good company of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, uh, I also have on the slide John Stuart Mill. We will when we when we'll talk about John Stuart Mill this year and next year. Next year we need to spend a month talking about John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill says that he's an Epicurean. He's a card-carrying Epicurean. So th this is not the last we have heard of Epicurus. We will, you know, modern-day Aristotelians or Platonists, not so much. I mean, Hegel to some extent, but Hegel introduces a lot of complications. Mill, I would say, in my own, in my own vision, Mill is, ex is actually fairly close to Epicurus. Okay, yeah, so uh, the Epicureans themselves, I think the way they would characterize their own teaching would be with this tetrapharmakos. Tetrapharmakos is a Greek word which means fourfold cure, fourfold cure. So a, a mm, remedy or a medicine which consists of four elements. And so these are the four elements. First, gods are not to be feared. Second, death is nothing to us. Third, pleasure is easy to obtain. Fourth, pain is easy to endure. So gods are not to be feared, death is nothing to us, pleasure is easy to obtain, or happiness, if you want, is easy to obtain, and pain or hardship is easy to endure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's try to explain, let's try to explain. So uh, uh, in general, Epicureans um, begin with um, empiricist, broadly speaking, empiricist methodology. And... Epicurean empiricism is immediately going to be different to Aristotelian empiricism. So both Epicureans and Aristotelians are supposed to be to, to have something you know empirical in the in their basis. Uh, but you see, Aristotle begins with this very strong assumption that the nature is at bottom orderly, that this world uh, is orderly and providential, that there's reason at work in this world, that everything is again well ordered and rational, everything has a natural purpose. Uh, Epicureans, in this sense, are much closer to modern-day empiricism. And um, their empiricism, um, well, is going to basically um, bottom out in, in two particular opinions. The first one is hedonism. Hedonism. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Hedonism coming from the Greek word hedone, which means pleasure. Uh, their idea would be that um, by observing um, our states of mind, by observing consciousness, we establish that pleasure is the good, and in fact, pleasure is the only good. And this is supposed to follow from their empiricism. And another empirical doctrine that they, that they uh, um, establish, develop, is atomism. And um, atomism, well, some question, can you actually demonstrate atomism empirically? But uh, still, um, the arguments of Epicureans in favor of atomism are going to be empirical in character. Now, if this was a course in uh, metaphysics or ontology, we would spend much more time about on, on sort of Epicurean arguments for atomism. I'm not sure we need to go into this in too much detail. I want to get to uh, ethics and politics as soon as possible. Um, I suppose I could just say this. See, the ancients had this uh, observation that, uh, that um, mm, there's change, but there's also stability right, in the universe. So things change. Like you, you can take a piece of wood and you can burn it, and it will change from wood to ash. So there's change, but there's also stability, right? Because um, wood turns into ash and smoke, 
it doesn't disappear into nothingness. So nothing seems to disappear entirely and also nothing seems to be simply created out of thin air. So it seems that there's certain conservation in the universe, right, going on. And, and also change, um, even though it's not always predictable, still it's an inter you know, it's, it's a, it seems to be a reasonable hypothesis that change is at the end of the day, orderly somehow, right? Because, you know, you, you take pieces of wood and they all burn into, into ash and, and smoke, right? And so uh, atomism is one very straightforward way to solve this problem. So you say that um, um, there are macroscopic objects, big, big objects, objects you can see with the naked eye, and they are made of smaller invisible objects. And so these smaller invisible objects are changeless but their macroscopic configurations can change. And uh, basically the rules that govern the microscopic objects determine the ways in which macroscopic objects change. Again, if this was a class in metaphysics, we'd talk much more about this, but I suppose that's fine. Um, and, uh, uh, we, you know, um, we're going to talk about atheism with a question mark. Uh, um, with respect to Epicureans, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's very clear from the very beginning that we are not talking about an orderly, un, orderly Aristotelian universe. This, this is not a, a teleological picture of the world. This is very much a picture in which you have this, again, in the words of Immanuel Kant, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, right? So you have these atoms, they bounce into uh, uh, one another, they, they, they smash into one another, and everything that we see is a product of this primordial chaos. And so, um, after the scientific revolution, Epicureanism will get, gain a lot of traction, a lot of traction. It will become a very popular doctrine among <laughs> many different uh, uh, philosophers. Um, anyway, and also we'll see the ideas of social contract in a second, in a second. Well, anyway, let's start somewhere. Well, um, let me begin, probably, let's talk some more about atomism. So... Mm, Epicurean atomism uh, goes back to Democritus, and Democritus is supposed to be the first atomist in the uh, ancient Greek tradition. And uh, according to Democritus, Democritus has this very famous phrase, he says, by convention sweet, by convention sour, by, by convention hot, by convention cold, by convention color, but in reality, atoms and void. In reality, atoms and void. So the idea being that mm, uh, nothing is intrinsically sweet or sour, nothing is intrinsically bitter or uh, you know, nothing intrinsically has particular colors. In reality, the only thing that exists is, again, in the words of Kant, the abyss of the purposeless chaos of matter, just atoms smashing into each other in the void. And um, I'm, I have this word relativism uh, uh, on, on the slide because one of the um, outgrowths of this is that, again, say hi to Hobbes. Again, this is not from Epicurus, but Epicurus, I think, would have a broadly speaking similar characterization nothing by itself is good or evil. Uh -huh. Because in reality, the only thing we have are atoms and the void. Again, this wonderful phrase, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire is that which he calls good. And the object of his hate and aversion he calls evil, there being nothing simply and absolutely so. so this is a quote from uh, Hobbes, but I think it applies to Epicurus and to Democritus as well. So, I'm going to re return back to this idea. Um, so atomism has implications for uh, moral philosophy, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, again, in, the, in terms of pleasure. Uh, again, I said, the object of man's appetite or desire is what he calls good. The object of his hate conversion he calls evil. We'll talk about this in a second. But before we do, let's talk about the gods and let's talk about the soul. So, uh, yeah, well, okay, so <laughs> I, I mentioned this already. Right? So, uh, in, ge in general, the Epicurean idea is we try to explain the world without reference to some kind of divine intelligence. And um, you got to understand, for the ancients, especially for somebody like Aristotle, the most important proof um, of the existence of uh, rationality in the fundamental structure of the universe, right? this idea that universe at bottom is rational and orderly, Right? whether it's a product of divine intelligence or something like that. Right? Uh, Aristotelian argument for that was that the universe is far too orderly to simply have come about by random chance. Let me repeat that. The universe seems far too orderly to be a result simply of chance. So Aristotle th thinks that the, the amount of order in the universe 
definitely points to uh, providential design. That again, maybe there, there's a god or, or gods, or in general, nature has purposes. Nature is purposeful and is trying to establish order, right? And um, from the very beginning, even before Aristotle began writing, there was a, another uh, so-called pre-Socratic philosopher who's writing before uh, Socrates, uh, whose name is Empedocles, and later uh, his ideas get incorporated into Epicureanism. And basically, these are the ideas of proto-Darwinian natural selection. So Empedocles imagines how mm, you have this primordial chaos of matter, primordial chaos of matter. Like, if you imagine a monkey typing on a typewriter, right, and just type, banging away at the, at the keyboard uh, for a really, really, really long time, you know, billions or maybe trillions or maybe, you know, <laughs> quadrillions of years, you know, 10 to the 10 to the 10 numbers of years, right? So eventually, the monkey, just by random combination, will type uh, Shakespeare or War and Peace, simply simply through random combination, right? And this is an Empedoclean idea, right? He says, from this primordial chaos, you get all sorts of creatures. You get, uh, you know, creatures who have branches instead of limbs, and you have, let's say, an, uh, a hand with 15 eyes, or an eye with 15 hands. So any, everything, everything that can possibly come from this primordial chaos gets generated. And then Empedocles says, but in the next generation, in the next generation, most of the creatures are unviable. I, I don't want to say creatures, because creatures implies that it, they were created, right? But, and they were not created. They are simply uh, combinations of random particles, right? Uh, that are coming out of this primordial chaos, right? So not creatures, but, but these beings, these organisms, right? Uh, uh, most of them are not viable. They die in the next generation. They cannot feed themselves. They cannot reproduce themselves. Only the ones that are fit to live on, in this world are the ones that survive. And only the ones that can mate and reproduce with one another, these are the only ones that survive. It's a very interesting idea. Again, <laughs> well, basically, this is, the, again, uh, uh, um, Darwin in a nutshell. Uh, uh, there were important advances between Empedocles and Darwin, um, which made the theory of evolution much more believable. But in broad outline, the theory of evolution existed in ancient times. And uh, uh, Empedocles held this idea, uh, Democritus, uh, so, uh, um, not Democritus, but uh, Epicurus held this idea, and later Epicurean philosophers like Lucretius also had this idea. I should, you know, I should insert the name of Lucretius in one of the slides, definitely, because he, he's probably the second most famous Epicurean philosopher after Epicurus. Again, Luc and Lucretius is going to be writing in uh, uh, Roman times in Latin. Um, anyway, so let me let me let me continue. Um, yeah. So and especially when we talk about the gods, we have this idea that natural science leads to happiness by dispelling superstition. So um, for Epicureans, we study the world to some extent because we are curious, but much more importantly, we study the world to get rid of superstition. And uh, most forms of religion would be empty superstitions for Epicureans. Epicureans have this. Again, atheism always with a question mark. I'll explain why in a second. But uh, Epicureanism has this uh, anti-religious um, sentiment. So the first idea about the gods that we meet in Epicureans goes like this. That which is blessed and immortal, and uh, uh, according to Greek mythology, uh, gods are supposed to be blessed and immortal. That, so, so that which is blessed and immortal is not troubled itself, nor does it cause trouble to another. As a result, it is not affected by anger or favor, for these things belong to weakness. Again, mm. so the Epicureans would say that by definition, if God or gods exist, mm -hmm, by definition, they have to be all-powerful, immortal, and blessed. And if you imagine this, imper this perfect, all-powerful being, this being, he or she or it, why are gods, well, I don't know, you know. <laughs> how do you establish the gender of the gods is not exactly clear to me, but whatever, right? So uh, uh, the gods are not supposed to care about anything. They should just reside in this wonderfully calm and tranquil and peaceful state, should not be bothered by anything. And in fact, for example, that's exactly what uh, Aristotle says about the gods. He says, divinity, what, what the divine intelligence does is the divine intelligence thinks about itself. It is a thought thinking itself, this pure contemplation, this uh, highest uh, <laughs> uh, intellectual, we talked about intellectual and moral virtues um, 
for Aristotle. And he talks about how intellectual virtues imitate the divine. This is what the divine is, mind is doing. The divine mind is contemplating itself, right? And um, Epicureans would say that if your image of the god or of the gods, right, as uh, some, some, something or somebody who cares about human beings, mm -hmm. who cares about, let's say, uh, um, whom do you have sex with and in which positions? How do you, uh, you know, which food do you eat and how do you prepare it? The Epicureans would say, you, you're being mad and you're being blasphemous. You are disrespecting the gods. This, this would be below the dignity of the gods to care about such petty matters, such, uh, you know, crass and uninteresting matters. Gods have much more interesting things to be doing, that is, being blessed and divine, and not caring about, you know, what petty humans do here, down here on earth. I had this quote from, um, uh, from Heraclitus, Heraclitus in the first class, how Heraclitus says, to the divine intelligence, all things are good and beautiful and fair. All things are good and beautiful and fair. And again, this idea that, you know, God is on the side of, of uh, you know, one tribe fighting another tribe, this is petty. This is petty. Gods are above all of this, right? And, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, uh, this, this idea of divinity presupposes the notion that God or gods do not care about us and do not care about what we do and, you know, will, will not judge us on what we do. Gods are entirely independent from us in a certain important respect. And uh, kind of notice um, Aristotle is, is different in many ways, but Aristotle to some extent would agree to some limited extent, uh, uh, partly because, you know, there is no afterlife in Aristotle. There is no judgment after you die in Aristotle. The, the, the divine intelligence does not deliver judgment after one's death. The divine intelligence contemplates itself. And uh, your punishment for being vicious uh, is that you are unhappy in this life for Aristotle and, and for the Epicureans as well. Although, again, there are, there, are, there are differences, but also important similarities. Now, let's talk some more about the gods. Now, you see, the interesting thing is that the Epicureans never actually seem to question the existence of the gods. Like, Epicurus says, you know, yeah, gods exist, Olympian gods exist, not, not a problem. And, you know, Epicureans would be willing to even participate in sacrifices, you know, Greek, ancient Greek sacrifices to the gods. But the question is, what is the status of the gods? So one alternative is that these are simply ideal images to imitate. So that gods are sort of blessed, uh, uh, exist in this perpetual state of ataraxia, freedom from disturbance. And we should, so these, I, these are ideal images in, in human minds, right? That we should imitate. So this, this, this view comes very close to atheism, right? Gods are real, but they exist as ideal images in people's minds, right? <laughs> they are real, but they, they exist as fantasies. Uh, well, which is to say that they're not real, right? Um, or the alternative is that, no, maybe gods are really, really real, right? But then they are detached in the sense that they do not care about us, right? And uh, uh, I've, I have this last point on my slide, you know, students, since I'm a you know, professor of philosophy, students very often ask me this question, do I believe in God? And I find this such a uh, bizarrely, what's the right phrase, um, misleading question, because what the hell do you mean by belief in God? Which kind of God, I want to uh, ask immediately, because different philosophies, different religions have radically different conceptions, radically different definitions of God, right? And, uh, um, you know, most people, when they ask this question, they never think about the possibility of Epicurean conception of divinity, where, yeah, you can believe in gods, but you can also believe that gods don't care about us and have nothing to do with us, right? And so, you know, if you, you know, does, does it count if you believe in those kinds of gods? So, yeah, okay, this is a long and complicated, you know, separate discussion. I don't want to take this class astray. But, like, in, in, in general, in general, I think that people severely, severely lack imagination when they, when they speak about God or the gods. There are many more possibilities than one, than one can, <laughs> can imagine. Uh, uh, well, well I'm, I plan to talk about skeptics later today. Uh, uh, and skeptics... Uh, mm, very much focus on this issue of how religions differ, religions differ. My favorite example in this respect is going to be a bit uh, silly, but whatever. Imagine that you believe in the God of the Saints Row universe. It's a popular video game. 
in, in Saints Row universe, uh, uh, the, your purpose of life, the purpose of existence, of human existence, is to cause as much carnage as possible, to run over as many innocent pedestrians as possible. And as a reward, the God of Saints Row uh, um, rewards you, um, imbues you with uh, uh, immortality, immunity to fall damage, but also, much more importantly, uh, infinite bullets, infinite ammo. Right? So if, if, is, is, is this the kind of God that you believe in? Well, okay, so I, you know, what, 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 I'm, what I'm driving at is that there are, it's possible to have radically different definitions of what God is or, or of what gods are. And again, 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 for the Epicureans, for the Epicureans, it's very clear that uh, gods are, are either, they don't exist, or if they do exist, they do not care about us. So effectively, effectively speaking, Epicureans are atheists. Because even if there are gods, they have nothing to do with us. Okay, okay. But Sextus Empiricus, Sextus Empiricus, uh, 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 who is my second favorite philosopher, also reproduces another argument which he attributes to Epicureans as well. Although this argument is not attested in the Epicurean sources, but whatever. So, uh, and this is another big problem, the problem of evil. This is in some sense, I think, I think this is the biggest problem in all of theology. It's problem number one. And very often, uh, uh, teachers will talk about this problem as if it should have an obvious solution. And I want to caution you against that. Maybe this problem does not have a solution. And the problem basically goes like this. Why is there evil in the world if this world is created by a good God? By the way, this problem is also applicable to Aristotle. Aristotle talks about how this world is orderly, but this world is not perfectly orderly. Yeah, there's some order in this world, but there's also a lot of chaos, and there's also a lot of uh, useless suffering. You know, think of, think of uh, uh, children dying of cancer or some, you know, some other horrible calamities. You know, when innocent people suffer seemingly to absolutely no end. Again, sort of natural, preventable, and seemingly useless suffering. How do you reconcile that with an image of an all-good, all-powerful God or the Council of Gods? So, uh, um, if you want... Let's go, let's, go, let's go through the problem of evil in this... Well, again, this is a quote from Sextus Empiricus from the Pyronian Hypotheses, uh, Book 3, Chapter 3. Um, um, so the way Sextus reproduces the argument basically goes like this. Are gods willing to prevent evil but not able? So then they would be limited and not gods. So gods want to prevent, e prevent evil but cannot. Well, then, then they're not gods. Are they able to prevent evil but not willing? So if gods can prevent evil but do not, this would mean that they are malevolent, that they hate us, right? And then, again, they're not gods. Uh, um, are they both able and willing? Well, then why is there evil in the world? And if the fourth logical possibility, gods are neither able nor willing, then, you know, why call them gods? So basically, the, you know, this, if this argument, to, to oversimplify, the idea is that uh, uh, for, and by the way, as far as I can tell, um, the Buddhists, the Buddhists, who are also, well, the word atheism is a complicated word, but you know, some strands of Buddhist philosophy are clearly uh, deeply atheistic, is what I'm trying to say. Some, uh, some Buddhists have a very similar argument against Hindu monotheism, right? So the ultimate idea being that the existence of evil in this world conclusively disproves the idea of, of benevolent and providential God. So again, it's a deep idea in philosophy, and we'll keep coming back to it. Uh, David Hume, David Hume in several classes, will again reproduce this idea. Again, some of you might have heard of arguments for the existence of God. Well, here you see the argument against the existence of God. God or gods. Okay, okay, okay. And... Um, I'm going to, I want to get to some of the more positive doctrines of Epicureans, but before I do, uh, uh, you know, let me, let me just continue with this, right? So um, this problem of evil also works against the ideas of natural law and the ideas of Aristotle's teleology, teleological worldview. So since this world is not an orderly place, again, you see all sorts of unnecessary, frivolous, uh, completely arbitrary suffering, right? Um, this supposedly disproves Aristotle's teleology and also works against the ideas of natural law. Natural law, for example, as expressed by uh, Cicero. Um, I, I meant, I, you know, like in principle, we are supposed to talk about natural law tradition. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll have the time. We'll definitely talk about it when we get to John Locke. 
So, but before John Locke, natural law tradition um, is associated with um, um, uh, Stoicism, and uh, Cicero is not a Stoic, but he's influenced by Stoicism. I'll get a quote from Cicero in a second. Um, so Cicero, and then later, especially later Christian writers, are going to talk about the natural law. So this is what Cicero says. There is, in fact, a true law, namely right reason, which is in accordance with nature. This law applies to all men and is unchangeable and eternal. By its command, this law summons men to the performance of their duties. By its prohibitions, it restrains them from doing wrong. It com its commands and prohibitions always influence good men, but are without effect upon the bad. To invalidate this law by human legislation is never morally right. Again, so this is an idea of a law of nature which is um, above the positive law of human societies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so to invalidate this law is, uh, by human legislation is never morally right, nor is it permissible to ever restrict its operation. And to annul it wholly is impossible. Uh, neither the Senate nor the people can absolve us from our obligation to obey the law of nature, and it requires no jurist to expound or interpret. It will not, they, uh, it will not lay down one rule at Rome and another at, at Athens. So we're talking about universal law, which is true in all times and in all places. Nor will it be one rule today and another one tomorrow. Again, universal law in all times and all places. Universal standard of morality, right? But there will be one law, internal and unchangeable, binding at all times upon all people, and there will be, as it were, one common master and ruler of men, namely God, who is the author of this law, its interpreter, and its sponsor. This is a quote from Cicero. Uh -huh. This man, the, the man who will not obey it, will abandon his better self, and in denying the true nature of man, will thereby suffer the severest of penalties, though he has escaped all other consequences, which men call punishment. So, <laughs> uh, uh, in general, I find this to be a hugely, deeply unsatisfying quote. We will see a lot of philosophers who will um, uh, fight against, who will argue against the ideas of natural law. For example, uh, well, Hobbes has his own vision of law of nature, but his law of nature is only valid as interpreted by positive law, as interpreted by the sovereign. Um, uh, John Stuart Mill, again, also will argue against the law of nature, against the law of nature, and I think so will Karl Marx. Again, this notion that um, it seems... Um, at first glance, at least, it seems at first glance, that in order for what Cicero is saying here to be right, this world needs to be really providential. There need to be really gods. And these gods should really care about us. And if people break the law, gods should punish them in a visible fashion. But this, again, to go back to arguments uh, um, from... Um, Epicureans, especially the problem of evil, right? This is very obviously not the case. We seem to be in this, you know, to go back to Protagoras, to protect, you remember the myth of uh, <laughs> Prometheus and Epimetheus, right? Uh, we seem to be forsaken. We are forsaken by the gods. The gods do not seem to care about us. The wicked people prosper and the virtuous people suffer. It's up to us to take matters into our own hands. And all of this talk about the law of nature is... Uh, um, Extraneous, it's useless. Again, law, as, as Hobbes is going to say in a couple classes, covenants without the swords are but words. So law of nature, which is not enforced by nature, is no law. Anyway, and again, uh, I, I find this quote from, uh, from Cicero deeply disturbing, deeply unsatisfying, because what is, what is the punishment? What is the punishment by breaking the law of nature? He says, uh, um, the man who will abandon, who will not obey the law of nature... Um, will uh, um, deny the true nature of man and will thereby suffer the severest of penalties. And it's not, it's not clear. Abandon, abandon his better self. Is this, is this really punishment? Will this really keep uh, evil people from doing evil? It's not clear. It's not clear. Again, who is the enforcer? Who is the enforcer of the law of nature? Is the most important uh, 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 idea. Okay, okay, okay. So this is, this is uh, in general, um, I said we have um, the tetrapharmacos, right? So we have uh, uh, the fourfold cure. So gods are not to be feared. Death is nothing to... Gods are not to be feared, but also gods um, will not take care of us. This is kind of important. We are forsaken, right? On the, on the, so we, we should not worry about gods, but we should also not hope that gods will help us, right? Um, the second, the second idea is that death is nothing to us. So let us now move to the second idea. So uh, the first thing I'm tempted to say is that, uh, um, you know, Epicureans will say that the soul 
must be material in order to influence the body and also to be influenced by the body. And a lot of people find the idea of the soul, uh, immaterial soul, deeply compelling. You know, I have many students every year to this day come up to me and to try to, you know, find some arguments in order to try to salvage the idea of the immortal, immaterial soul. Uh, and although we do not really have a conclusive uh, answer, like, I don't think <laughs> anybody can seriously claim to know 100% certainly what happens to us after we die. You know, we don't have that knowledge. But still, there is an argument, which again goes back to Epicureans and probably beyond. And the argument is very simple. Um, you see, supposedly, your soul can move your body, right? So you, you, you th you, I, I, I think of something, right? I, I have, a, have a desire and I, I have a volition, a will, and this will makes my body move around, makes my mouth open. So I have a certain process which influences my material body. And the natural implication is that this, this material, the, 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 sorry, that this process also has to be material. So if the soul can influence the body, then it should be material. And this goes the other way around as well. You can make a very simple uh, experiment. Uh, so unless this offends your religious sensibilities, you can take a small uh, bit of alcohol and ingest it. Many people, many students I know do this, sometimes even daily. And this affects the functioning of your soul. It's a very, you know, you know uh, 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 experimental philosophy, experimental philosophy, right? You can do it with uh, uh, um, uh, other substances too. Uh, let's imagine something, something, something very benign. A lot of people um, report how chocolate, chocolate has profound effect on their soul. Like if you haven't eaten chocolate for 24 hours, life seems bleak and miserable. Like it's not worth getting out of bed in the morning, right? But then you take a small bit of chocolate and suddenly the world is transformed, right? And your, your soul rejoices. Right? So the, the idea is that causation goes both ways. Your soul can affect your body, but also something deeply material, like chocolate or like alcohol or like antidepressant drugs, can affect your soul. And not just, not just your mood, but, but affect your character, affect the kind of person you are, affect the kinds of decisions that you make. And so the natural implication is that soul is simply material. Right? So uh, Epicureans would say that the soul is an organization of very fine atoms spread throughout the body. You can almost imagine this as a, analogous to the nervous system uh, that contemporary physiology talks about. And so the Epicureans would say that um, um, when your body dies, there's a process of disintegration. And among other things, the soul disintegrates as well. And so your, your ability to exist as a conscious being, your ability to have conscious experiences is very much tied to the body. Like, again, the idea is that uh, most of what we are is, is, is deeply physical, right? So right now, I know that I am alive because I have all sorts of sensations. I feel the temperature. I feel the flow of the air in my nostrils. I feel the weight of clothing on my body, you know, I, I have a certain uh, taste in my mouth, right? So uh, this, this is what constitutes my physical existence. If you take away all of my senses, if you take away all of my senses, it seems that there's nothing left of me. Like there's no meaningful existence that's left, right? How um, uh, Socrates says in the Apology, death is total annihilation. is like a dreamless sleep. And we know, we know today from neurophysiology that uh, things such as um, fantasies, imagination or memories are also can be physically lo localizable in the brain. So it seems from the standpoint of contemporary neurophysiology highly plausible that if your uh, uh, nervous system, if, if, sort of, if your body is destroyed, then whatever consciousness may be left, there's, there's nothing to experience. There's no experience. Again, like, uh, uh, even, even if there's something of you that remains, it experiences nothing. Again, as uh, the, the metaphor that Socrates uses is a dreamless sleep, a dreamless sleep, total nothingness, right? And uh, the Epicureans take this as something deeply optimistic, right? As something to be embraced, something to be happy about. Because again, uh, uh, um, again, this idea that death is nothing to us. Death is nothing to us. Most people dread death as the, as the uh, most horrible and frightening evil. However, it's not. It's not. Because while we exist, death is not present. 
And when death is present, when we die, then we no longer exist. And when you no longer exist, then uh, it's, it's neither good nor bad. So it's like, again, while you're alive, it is useless to fear death because death is not with you. But once you are dead, it's not going to be anything bad because it's not going to be anything. It's not going to be anything good or bad. So death is not to be looked forward to. It's not to be embraced. But it's also not, to be, not something to be afraid of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, also, so this is, I think, from Lucretius. Lucretius gives, I think, some like 30 reasons to uh, not be afraid of death. But one of them, among them, uh, uh, is this one. And I, I think, I, I genuinely think this one is interesting. I had multiple students come up to me in the past and say that this is, this is, this is a wonderful idea that they have never had before. So it's Lucretius. If I can spell this, I hope I can spell this, yeah. Um, wonderful, wonderful Roman poet. So he sa Lucretius says, this is called the symmetry argument. Imagine the state that you were in before you were born. So anybody, anybody in the virtual room, has this ever happened to you? Like you wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweat, remembering the horrible time that you had to go through before you were born? Lucretia says, no, of course not. Nobody remembers anything since the time before we were born because there was nothing. We did not have any experiences. So the same way that the time before you were born is not bad, is not to be dreaded, right? The same way time after you die is not going to be bad, and therefore you should not be afraid of it. Again, this symmetry argument. Hmm. I, I think, I personally think, again, this is not a knockdown argument. In philosophy, there are no knockdown arguments. Of course, you can imagine whatever you want, right? But I, still, 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 within the limits of, uh, you know, uh, hypothetical limited knowledge that human beings have, I think it's a pretty strong argument, pretty powerful argument. So again, so the fourfold cure, right? Uh, uh, gods are not to be feared. Death is nothing to us. Um, there's uh, uh, another issue with the soul. So there's, I, I want to spend just one moment talking about this. It's a very famous doctrine of the swerve, of the swir swerve associated with Epicurus. The idea being that everything is physically determined. Again, so atomism entails determinism. However, uh, so, so there's a doctrine which Lucretius talks about, and it's not really attested in excellent writings of Epicurus. So maybe Epicurus held this doctrine, maybe he didn't. We don't know, but uh, Lucretius talks about it. The idea being that in order for us to have free will, there needs to be this indeterminacy in the atoms. And many people are ecstatic about this and they say, oh, wow, Epicurus has predicted Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, how in quantum mechanics interactions are supposed to be indeterministic. Well, I think that there's so many problems with this view. Uh, the first one, so this is, this is if, you, if this is really true, if Epicurus really held this, this is the weakest point in his, in his doctrine, at least you know, in, to my mind. Uh, uh, first of all, because um, this random swerve, you know, or the kind of thing that you get in, in quantum mechanics, is supposed to be random. And there's a big difference between randomness and freedom. See, and in, in fact, we'll, 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 we'll talk about this later, especially when we get to David Hume. David Hume, who doesn't believe in free will, um, says that to be free is simply to be determined by the right kinds of causes. So, you know, people have a stable character, right? And so, um, in some sense, we are free when we are predictable, when we act in character according to some long-term plan. So, for example, you know, you, after you're uh, graduated from a uh, bachelor's program, you decide to enroll into a master's program. And you sit about it, you, you sit, you think, and, 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 you, and, you, and you make an important decision. Or, or, maybe, or maybe you decide, uh, should you get married? Should you get married to this particular person, right? It's not supposed to be a random decision. It's not supposed to be a coin toss. No, it's ideal, under ideal circumstances, it is supposed to be something completely certain, right? You should not feel this uh, um, indeterminacy. In fact, you should feel, under ideal circumstances, most people would prefer to feel completely sure. Now, like, I should enroll into this master's program. It is clearly the best for me. No randomness involved, right? Or I definitely should marry this person. She, uh, he or she is the best choice for me, right? Or I definitely should vote for this particular candidate, right? So, this, again, I, I think there's a big problem with uh, uh, talking about, again, free will and randomness. Free will is supposed to not be about randomness, right? Um, so, again, uh, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, don't, don't even get me started on that. It's another course I teach, course in philosophy of science. It's all sorts of problems with this view, and uh, um, there's only 
Copenhagen interpretation is the indeterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics, but there are others, deterministic interpretations like pilot wave of may, or many worlds. If you, don't, if you did not understand what I, what I said right now, don't worry too much because <laughs> we do not study this stuff on this course. Uh, but if you're interested, uh, ask me after class sometimes. Anyway, anyway. So uh, let me go back. So again, God's not to be feared. Death is nothing to us. Okay, let's finally get to the most important ideas of the Empicureans. So uh, pleasure is easy to obtain. Pain is easy to endure. So uh, again, for Epicureans, as for other Hellenistic schools, happiness is the practical goal of philosophy. And happiness, in some sense, is the most important um, goal of philosophizing. And I mentioned already, again, this philosophy as therapy, philosophy as therapeutic, philosophy ideally being to the soul, what medicine is to the body. It's a very famous phrase from Epicurus that uh, 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 very often uh, uh, philosophy programs like to uh, promulgate, like to peddle, right? Um, um, it's gonna let, let no young man delay the study of philosophy. Let no old man become weary of it. It's never too early, never too late to care for the well-being of the soul. Again, philosophy is care for the soul. The man who says <laughs> that the season for his study has not yet come or has already passed is like the man who says that it's too early or too late to be happy. Okay, so Epicureanism is first and foremost about happiness. So a uh, popular misconception of Epicurean philosophy is this idea of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. So this is crossed out because this is not true. This is not Epicureanism at all. Uh, however, Epicureans do talk, do have this quote, that pleasure is the beginning and the end of the blessed life. We recognize pleasure as the first and natural good. Starting from pleasure, we accept or reject, and we turn to pleasure as we judge every good thing, trusting this feeling of pleasure as our guide. So, and this is a deeply empirical stance. This is a deeply empirical stance. So the Epicureans uh, look at this Aristotelian idea that Oh, let's talk about these parts of the soul, how humans have this highest function, you know, rationality, capacity for speech, which d d distinguishes us from animals, and, you know, the proper human excellence should lie in exercising our highest ability. And the Epicureans say, what? Why? Why do you think that? Do you have an argument for that? The Epicureans basically say that, again, that uh, um, um, Aristotle's assumptions are not really warranted. Again, so the Epicureans want this um, imminent empirical criterion. Like, right? how do you know that human beings have this, this or that function? Can, can Aristotle prove to us that we have this function, that this is the, the meaning of life, to exercise uh, um, reason in an excellent fashion? Or uh, talk about religious philosophies, especially this divine uh, command theory of uh, morality, right? This idea that you are supposed to do what God or gods tell you to do. So again, Epicureans, in this empirical fashion, ask this question, how do I know? How do I know if God or gods tell me, tell me this, right? So it's like, uh, you could say, well, it's written in this or that book, the Bible or the Quran, let's say, but the Epicureans would ask this empirical question. But empirically speaking, can you verify the Bible or the Quran? You know, if, they, if there was a god who's, or, or gods like uh, Athena and Zeus and they were present daily in our lives and, and rewarded the righteous and punished the wicked, that would be one thing. But sort of these books, these stories about prophets who seemingly, you know, talk about gods, we'll see, we'll see this later in, um, in Hobbes. Hobbes asked this question. Suppose a person is prophesizing for God, right? He's supposed to speak uh, the words of God. How do we know? How can we check? How can we guarantee? He says, Hobbes says, human beings can be mistaken. Human beings can be mad. Human beings can lie. How, how can we be sure, right? So what is the empirical verification? So uh, uh, um, the Epicureans, as opposed to religious philosophies and as opposed to uh, Aristotle, would say that uh, happiness is the natural good. If you look at children, or if you look at animals, it seems that everybody wants happiness, everybody, happiness as defined by pleasure. Everybody wants pleasure, right? And uh, there's this famous and important is ought problem. Um, now, this is a technical, and we'll come back to it later, especially those of you who are going to write about John Stuart Mill next year, you will have to wrestle with this problem. It's called naturalistic fallacy. Sort of uh, the basic idea is that from the fact that, uh, that we want pleasure, can we really conclude that pleasure is the good? And the answer is, technically speaking, logically speaking, no. The fact that we want pleasure doesn't logically entail that it's good, right? 
But the Epicureans and John Stuart Mill would say that in the absence of any other evidence, in the absence of any other arguments, we can only do what we want to do. Because like, there's no reason to not do what you want unless you give a reason. And the Epicureans and John Stuart Mill as empiricists would say that there is no other reason. Again, Aristotle's uh, reasoning does not strike them as convincing and uh, divine command theory you know, is not empirically verifiable as well. So it's not really a solution to the Izzot problem. So like, it's not necessarily the way it should be because who knows um, what, what, what should we do. But as a matter of fact, what everybody does is pursue pleasure. Anyway, but, but we are talking about this maximizing the long-term chances of overall happiness for Epicureans. So this, again, prioritizing natural desires. Uh, I'll talk about this some more in a second. Uh, somewhat akin to Diogenes, the cynic, right? Prioritize natural desires. And also Epicureans put a very high value on ataraxia, you know, again, freedom from disturbance, on self-control and moderation as guides to happy life over the, over the long term, right? So again, again, going back to this idea, he is not rich who has much, but he is rich who needs little, right? So it's like, if you really want to be happy through experiencing pleasure, it is like often much easier to train your body and your mind to not desire things which are hard to attain. And that way you gain pleasure, you know, in a much more straightforward, much easier fashion. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so uh, pleasure is the chief and the natural good. Yeah, I think we had a very similar quote in a second. Yeah, but, and, and here again, so when we say pleasure is the, is, the, is the end, pleasure is the goal, we don't mean any pleasures, right? But by pleasure, we mean the state wherein the body is free from pain and mind from anxiety. And Epicurus says, neither continual drinking or dancing, nor sexual love, nor enjoyment of, of fish, or other luxurious food, whatever else luxurious table uh, um, offers bring about uh, the pleasant life. Rather, it is produced by the reason which is sober and examines the motives for every choice and rejection and which drives away all those opinions through which the greatest tumult lays hold of the mind. So basically, the, the idea is, again, uh, um, think back to Calicles, right? This idea of... Uh, the goal of life is to have as many desires and as extravagant desires as possible and to try to satisfy them as much as possible. And the Epicureans agree with Socrates. They would say, this is not the best way to achieve uh, happiness even through pleasure. Again, if you have, so, I mean, to have a desire, to have an unsatisfied desire is painful. Like, and again, human beings get used to things. Like if you eat every day, uh, breakfast, lunch, and, and dinner, in a five-star restaurant, and you get used to that, uh, well, first of all, you get used to it, and you don't get as much pleasure out of luxurious food, you know, a tenth time or a hundredth time, the same way you did the first time you ate luxurious food. And then you become addicted to it in an important sense. And now, not eating not in a five-star restaurant, but in a four-star star restaurant, this causes you pain. Or like, imagine you live in a flat with 10 rooms, and now you have to move out, and you're going to live in a flat with nine rooms, right? And, and, and you suffer because of that, right? So, and the Epicureans would say that a much better strategy is to train yourself to be satisfied with little. Again, again, the food is probably the easiest example. If you train yourself, if you follow a dietary regimen so that you eat, uh, um, you know, small amounts of healthy food every day, things like raw vegetables will taste like feast, right? Uh, uh, Epicurus talks about how if you're really hungry, um, bread and cheese tastes wonderful, right? And, and, and again, notice we are maximizing pleasure, but in this very uh, almost ascetic or ascetic kind of way, right? Now, um, when we talk about pleasures, well, let, let's probably start with this. So there are, uh, uh, pleasures are um, necessary uh, and unnecessary, and then there are natural and vain pleasures. So let's start with natural and vain pleasures. So the, the vain pleasures or unnatural pleasures are especially associated for Epicureans with desire for honor and glory. Uh, desire, again, this pleonexic desire to have more and more, to have crowns and statues erected in your honor. So this would be the vision of pleonexia, pleonexia, right? Having more and more, having more than your fair share. And th these are vain, unnatural desires which are impossible to satisfy. 
to, uh, for somebody like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Rousseau will call this amour proper, amour proper, right? Um, this vain and endless desire to, for glory. Uh, uh, um, Hobbes is going to also talk about something like this. Then there are natural but unnecessary desires, like desires for sex or, or expensive food, uh, unnecessary in the sense that uh, they are not necessary for life and that they are not necessary even for happy life. Epicurus says that you know, if, you don't if you don't have sex, you don't die because of that. Right? And in fact, if you, if you follow a proper regimen of life, you can even be happy never having sex, just you know, uh, uh, in, 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 by training yourself to enjoy other things. But then, then there are also necessary pleasures. And necessary uh, desires, which bring necessary pleasure, would be desire for water, nutrition, or oxygen, these kinds of things. Right? And um, these, especially natural unnecessary desires, it's fine to have them. So uh, um, it's fine to have them as long as they do not cause you too much trouble. This is, this is the ultimate idea. Um, okay, so then, then they also talk about this. I, I, okay, so and in terms of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, again, the, the, the natural pleasures would be this amour de soi, this desire to be uh, happy, just to feel good. Um, and the, the vain desires would correspond to amour proper, this perpetual and restless desire to be glorified, to have statues erected in your honor. And Rousseau, to some extent agreeing with the Epicureans, says that it is only because we have amour proper that we become slave to, slaves to society. That if we only cared about amour de soi in this quasi-cynical fashion, think about Diogenes, um, society would not be able to enslave us and, and to make us even unhappy. Um, there's another, another idea in the Epicureans, again, this idea of uh, catastematic or, or, or static pleasures versus dynamic or kinetic pleasures. And uh, kinetic pleasures are pleasures which are associated with... Um, Desire and satisfaction of desire, like um, dynamic pleasures or kinetic pleasures, is let's say um, um, in order to enjoy food, you have to be hungry first. In order to uh, enjoy, you know, well, something like that. You know, in, in order to enjoy, um, well, let, let's 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 stop with or, or, like in order to enjoy money, you need to want money first, right? And whereas. Static pleasures, static pleasures are uh, pleasures that, that do not accompany this feeling of craving. Uh, and for the Epicureans, the static pleasures would first and foremost be associated with uh, pleasures of the soul, pleasures uh, of the mind, right? So, yeah. So, for example, reminiscence, thinking in your head, remembering uh, good times that you had in the past. Uh, you can try this. You know, if you go have a wonderful vacation, <laughs> right? After you come back, you can, you know, find time throughout the day. Just sit there and, and think about the wonderful time you had during your vacation. And this will bring pleasant memories, right? And, and this, this uh, uh, Epicurus says, this is a static pleasure. It costs you nothing. And, and it's there. Or, or, or uh, you know, um, you can think back to some other pleasant uh, memories in the past. And in general, this mindful state or state of meditation, again, there are some, probably some parallels to Eastern philosophies, especially to Buddhism. And in general, pleasures of the mind tend to be more stable, more secure, and maybe even more pleasant, right? Uh, uh, so these, are, these would be the static pleasures. And you see, Epicu Epicureans have this interesting uh, um, notion, which I think at the end of the day is plausible. Like again, uh, think back to Callicles. Callicles says you need to have as many desires as extravagant and try to satisfy them much. But imagine you wake up in the morning and you just feel good. You feel good. And you don't feel any particular desire to do anything. Are you unhappy? Are you unhappy? Like, you know, imagine a lazy summer morning. You wake up, go, you know, maybe have a cup of coffee and you just sit there and, and stare at the, uh, at the blue sky and you hear the birds chirping. And, you know, life is just good. You don't have any, again, any desire to, you know, uh, <laughs> go, you know, earn a lot of money or, you know, find, uh, you know, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You just, you just sit there calmly. And, you know, uh, 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 Epicureans would say that, again, Callicles is wrong because he, does, he cannot appreciate this state. That, again, the, the abs sorry, absence of desire, absence of desire is as pleasant as satisfaction of desire. Absence of desire is as pleasant as satisfaction of desire. If you don't have a particular desire, you, uh, you're not bothered by it. Anyway, and again, again, Epicureans are not against pleasure. Pleasure is fine if it doesn't cost you too much, right?
However, however, once you have to jump through, you know, all sorts of hoops to, to get bronze statues or maybe golden statues erected in your honor, then maybe it's not really worth it. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and of course, the pleasures of the mind are usually non-rival. Like, if I enjoy them, you can enjoy them too. And the highest pleasure I'm going to talk about in a second are pleasures of philosophy, but also pleasures of friendship, right? And it's, it's, it's a non-rival thing. I can enjoy philosophy and you can enjoy philosophy. In fact, we can enjoy philosophy together. And if we enjoy philosophy together, this increases your enjoyment and this increases my enjoyment. Uh -huh. And th again, I, I keep referring to this phrase. Remember it, remember it. We'll come back to it. Again, John Stuart Mill, higher versus lower pleasures. For John Stuart Mill, you can, you can have a consensual, harmonious society precisely because higher pleasures are more pleasant and also are non-competitive, non-rival. Again, Epicurus recounts, uh, he writes a letter on his deathbed. He is dying um, from very painful disease and he says that his suffering cannot be increased he suffers as much as human body can suffer, but he blocks out the pain. He has trained his mind and his body throughout all these years. Uh, again, Socrates has this idea that, that, a, uh, that a virtuous man, an excellent man, will be happy even on a rack, even if you are being tortured. And here's Epicurus expressing this Socratic virtue, right? He says that even though his body is suffering, he simply, you know, through power of his will, through power of meditation maybe or something like that, right? He blocks out the pain and he simply focuses on the uh, pleasant memories of the past conversations with his friends. And this is what makes him happy even on his deathbed as he's dying from a, uh, from, from a, a painful disease. Okay, I talked about the imminent criterion already. Um, anyway. Yeah, so again, so tetrapharmakos. God's not to be feared. Death is nothing to us. Pleasure is easy to obtain and pain is easy to endure if you train your mind and body to do this. But, in, but you know, Epicurus says that even to the untrained mind, you gotta understand that, uh, well, he says that as a matter of human psychology, sharp pain doesn't last for very long. And, and chronic pain is something that you can get used to and by psychological techniques, you know, avoid. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, 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 talking about Epicureanism versus egoism or Epicureanism versus pleonexia, right? So what would Epicureanism, you know, say about these issues? And uh, you see, the, the, the ultimate idea, the ultimate idea is that, uh, you see, uh, um, especially if you imagine this sort of ring of Gyges, right? Why would an Epicurean need the ring of Gyges? So uh, the Epicurean could say that sort of, if, even if you had a ring of invisibility, you would still have this lingering doubt. Maybe it would stop working, right? So, so you, you put on the ring of invisibility and you go around, you know, raping and murdering people. But how do you know? Maybe in the next moment the ring will stop working and you will get caught and you will get punished. And you see, again, Epicureans have this idea that the highest pleasures available to us are the pleasures of tranquility and serenity. And these pleasures are very cheap, very cheap. It's like you need to satisfy your basic desires to not die, right? But it doesn't take very much. I mean, human beings, don't need much to not suffer. Again, this is an idea that John Stuart Mill will, will again go back to. But again, it's very easy to alleviate human suffering. But once, once, once you have enough money to not suffer from hunger or thirst and have you know, shelter, right? Above that, the highest pleasure is almost, almost comes to you for free. Again, the pleasures of meditation, the pleasures of philosophy, it doesn't, doesn't really cost anything. Or, or, or almost costs almost nothing. Again, John Stuart Mill imagines how much does a public library cost? It doesn't cost very much. Uh, uh, but, you know, if you, if you are trying to be unjust, you will constantly be um, uh, afraid that you will get caught and get punished. And it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. Epicurus says, yes, all pleasure is good. Yes, all pleasure is good. And, you know, like, uh, again, uh, uh, Hobbes would say, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire, is that which he calls good. And, you know, even to a, a, like a homicidal maniac, to some psychopath, killing people and bathing in their blood is pleasant. And Epicurus does not deny that. Yeah, maybe, maybe there are people who find pleasure in bathing in human blood, but it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Because you'll get caught and you'll get punished. And, and, or, 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 at least, or at least you will be afraid of that. And it's, it's much easier to sit down, meditate, and explain to yourself that you don't actually need to bathe in human blood. Mm, uh, uh, and and uh, Epicurus says that um, the wise man, the wise man, will not even be tempted to break the law. 
But most people, or many people, are not wise. Are not wise, so they need to be kept in line through the fear of punishment. And so, like in in general, so so injustice is not worth the trouble for the Epicureans, right? And and justice, justice is basically again this idea that people enter into communities in order to gain protection from the dangers of the wild, from wild animals, and from the elements. So this is the the early the early idea of social contract of social contract in Epicureans. Uh, um, so the early social contract tradition. And social contract is this agreement to neither harm nor be harmed. And justice is useful, sort of justice is what is useful in mutual associations. And like the other virtues, justice is valued only on instrumental grounds. So justice is good because it helps us all become happy. And um, I suppose there is this, uh, strictly speaking, uh, distinction between, uh, um, well, I don't want to say, uh, not distinction, but um, there's this idea that a good law, a good law, uh, should be the one that is actually useful. So only laws that are actually useful are just. We will see a similar idea in Hobbes. Uh, I don't want to foreshadow things too much, but you know, it's, it's a similar. So, so a, a a good law, a good law will actually be useful to the people, right? And um, so a prohibition on murder is just, you know, to the extent that it helps community thrive. But some laws, uh, the example from an uh, internet encyclopedia of philosophy is this uh, anti-miscegenation laws. So let's say, let's say racist laws that prohibit interracial inter interracial marriages, right? These laws, these laws would be unjust because uh, they don't they don't provide any benefit to the community. So again, so Epicureans, it's interesting, right? So on the one hand, they value ataraxia. Uh, but on the other hand, when they talk about a social contract, there is a bit of a social criticism in there, in, 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 in Epicureanism. They provide a certain criterion by which to judge better laws or worse laws. And again, we'll talk about utilitarianism. We'll talk about people like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. They, again, this is the modern uh, interpretation of, of Epicurean philosophy. And they would say that the whole task of the government is to maximize human happiness. Happiness, in, you know, understood in terms of pleasure. And if, if a law, like, you know, this anti-miscegenation law, if it doesn't bring about happiness, it's a, it's a useless law, maybe it's even a bad law, and it should be stricken. So again, so uh, Epicureans provide this criterion of, for, for deciding. Uh, now, in general, in general, Epicurean idea was this, uh, Epicurus himself um, um, had his school in a garden just outside the city of Athens. And it was a small voluntary community, and very importantly, very importantly, it accepted uh, women and slaves. Uh, so Epicurus, again, I, I, I talked about this uh, cosmopolitan uh, character of Epicurean philosophy. Well, here, 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 we have the, uh, we see, we see the 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 the, the, the payoff, right? Because um, Epicurus is going to say, well, we're all humans. We can all equally feel pleasure. We can all equally feel pain. So there's no real reason for us to exclude or to discriminate against women or against slaves. Um, and um, in general, Epicur Epicurus has a lot of very, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> um, extravagant things to say about friendship. For Epicureans, and again, friendship would be, in general, would be this uh, uh, paradigmatic, uh, static pleasure static or catastematic pleasure. It's a pleasure without the accompanying pain, right? So it's like you can crave chocolate or you know how uh, uh, addicts crave drugs, right? But you don't crave uh, seeing your friends, normally at least, right? And so, 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 so uh, um, um, pleasure or friendship is this, um, uh, what's the right phrase? It's a wonderful, wholesome pleasure without the accompanying pain. So much so that I think at some point, I, don't, I, don't, I, I did not include this as a quote, but um, Epicurus says that the, uh, the, oh yeah, yeah, the quote, the last quote, the man of noble character is chiefly concerned with wisdom and friendship. Wisdom is mortal good, but friendship is immortal good, right? And he says friendship has its beginning as a result of utility, but at the end is chosen for its own sake. It's kind of a complicated thought, and I'll expand on it in a second. And of course, there's this <laughs> very famous quote from Epicurus that friendship goes dancing around the world, announcing to all of us to wake up to happiness, right? And so, especially when we talk about this friendship valued for its own sake, there's an important question of, what about self-sacrifice? Would you sacrifice yourself for your friends? And especially, uh, 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 you know, 
uh, what would the Epicureans say about tyrannicide? So this is a particular example. So um, uh, Julius Caesar, as you know, was assassinated. And people who killed Caesar, they actually thought that they were doing a good thing, that they were killing a vicious tyrant. And some of the Ju assassins of Julius Caesar were Epicureans. And so you could ask, what is their justification for doing something dangerous? Again, Hobbes and Milk are also going to be, broadly speaking, hedonists. How would you, how would you uh, um, uh, justify self-sacrifice? And I think the Epicureans would say that um, in general, in general, um, death is not a bad thing. So you, it's not like you should seek death. Uh, Epicureans never recommend suicide. I mean, it's like... Uh, no, no, no real point in killing yourself. Uh, uh, not to mention that, like in general, as empiricists, I think Epicureans have to be aware that you cannot 100% guarantee what's going to happen to you after you die. So just on the off chance, it, it, you, you should not risk your life without a good reason. However, if there is a good reason, if you, again, the community of friends um, is a very important thing for Epicurus, among other things, because it, it, it uh, helps you uh, satisfy your necessary uh, desires as well, right? So, they, they, remember, they lived in a garden just outside the city of Athens, and a garden was a place uh, to hang out, to, to meet, to talk with friends, to enjoy this, but also, also, the garden was a place to grow food, to grow food to actually sustain your body. So, they have this, uh, you know, uh, almost a hippie commune, right? <laughs> And uh, uh, the, po the, po the, point, the point is that, um, I don't know, uh, how, should I, how should I put this, right? So why would you risk your life? So in an important sense, I think that Epicureans would say that um, life by itself is not good. Good life is good in itself. And in order to have a good life, ideally, you would want to be a part of a community of friends. And again, notice how in this quote, uh, Epicurus says that, Friendship begins as something which only uh, gives us utility, is only just useful to us, but then we begin to value friends uh, for their own sake. And so if, if, you, if, if you are a member of this community of friends and something endangers it, then, yeah, you might as well go out your way and protect it. And maybe this would even be worth risking your life if this is the necessity of the situation, right? Because, because you would rather risk your life in order to try to save your community than to lose the community of friends and, and be worse off, right? Something along those lines. It's a complicated story, and uh, um, many philosophers find Epicurean answer not exactly satisfactory because, you know, if on this egoistic account, if death is the end, should you really do it? But Epicurus himself definitely had this, again, pro-social pro idea. Uh, and in, in general, in general, Epicureans would be against engaging in politics, because it's just uh, too much trouble and it uh, breaks your ataraxia. Again, I mentioned how for, for Aristotle, uh, political participation is a good in itself. For Epicureans, not really. Uh, politics mostly distracts us and they are suspicious of politics and politicians that they are probably in it for, uh, you know, because of their desire for fame and you know, for statues being erected in their honor. So like in general, you should not really bother with that. But uh, um, if, if the well-being of the community rests on it, like if the circumstances force you to, yes, you will engage in politics, so much so that, again, again, some of the assassins of Julius Caesar were uh, um, Epicureans. Okay, okay, okay. So, wrapping up our discussion of Epicureans, I just want to mention that sort of there was a huge revival of Epicureanism and interest, interest in Epicureanism after the uh, Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution. Again, this doctrine, this uh, materialism, this anti-teleology seemed very much in line with uh, uh, the sciences of the day, the new scientific uh, science emerging after the Scientific Revolution, the idea of humanism um, and, uh, uh, you know, Renaissance humanism, to some extent Renaissance secularism. It's kind of, uh, again, Epicureans gained a lot of traction. And so, like, in general, often the way that uh, um, history of philosophy courses are taught is that Plato and Aristotle are the focus, and then, uh, you know, the Hellenistic schools are a less interesting afterthought. And um, I want to rectify that. You know, in fact, if we had more classes, <laughs> I would spend more time on the, Hel on the Hellenists, especially on the Epicureans. Because to a very large extent, they are the ones who carry the torch forward. Again, you will not really find modern Platonists or modern Aristotelians. Again, Hegel to some extent is an exception, but it's, he's really an exception who proves the rule because there's a huge difference between Hegel and Aristotle. Whereas Epicureanism is very much alive, again, for example, in the philosophy of John Stuart Mill. But not just John Stuart Mill. 
There's a very famous dissertation that a philosopher whom we're going to study has written. And the name of the dissertation well, is the difference between Democritian and Epicurean philosophy of nature. So there is a, philo there is a philosopher whom we're going to study who wrote his doctoral dissertation on the subject of Democritus and Epicurus. Ah, who is this person, right? So here's, the, here's the picture. So in the, it's in German, right? Difference der Demokritischen und Epikurischen Naturphilosophie, right? And this person is Karl Heinrich. I'm sorry for being so dramatic, but I just cannot resist. It's, of course, Karl Heinrich Marx. And I think that there's an important lesson for us. This idea of maybe there's something uh, uh, interesting going on, right? Between communism and uh, the Epicurean Garden of Friends, right? This... Uh, notion, you know, of, of people getting, and again, again, sort of, you can think of Marxist atheism, of this idea that the, the, the purpose of this life is happiness here and now, and um, I'm sure, uh, of course, I did uh, talk about how um, Marx shares many of Aristotelian assumptions, but I think that at the end of the day, uh, Marx is more of an Epicurean than, than an Aristotelian. Now, of course, we should not oversimplify. Marx is so much more than just an Epicurean, but, uh, but you know, in, in general, there is an important uh, uh, connection there. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, I am not sure how we're doing for time. Now, in principle, I want to talk about uh, the skeptics, but I feel that our time is maybe... Uh, 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 close to being over. Um, hmm. So what? And my discussion of skepticism is actually was supposed to be slightly more technical and slightly more maybe uh, slightly slightly uh, less clear. So I, I, I promised I promised uh, that Epicurus is going to be the focus of this lecture. So maybe maybe what I will do is uh, I will finish the lecture here and uh, I'll talk about um, skepticism. Uh, in a separate video, and people who want to watch it uh, can can do that too. Okay, colleagues, colleagues, or I should say friends, friends, right? Um, uh, oh yeah, there's 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 another uh, things I, I I wanted to mention with respect to uh, Epicureanism, uh, and this is the idea of uh, if you combine Epicureanism and skepticism. It seems that you get something very similar to Buddhism, and that's kind of you know just an interesting thought. Just you know, with a always with a question mark, always with a question mark. But um, again, uh, this has been going for uh, quite some time. So maybe to try to wrap this up, okay, let's let's uh, put on the most important slide. See again, like uh, uh, in my own studies of philosophy. One of, you know, I, I told you that Epicurus and Sextus Empiricus are two of my favorite ancient Greek philosophers. Probably my, my favorite modern philosopher, at least early modern philosopher, is David Hume. And um, when I was about your age, I was, I was actually very impressed by Epicurus. So, so Epicurus has been my interest for a very, very long time, like almost from the very beginning. And, and uh, um, I've been reading, um, the, first, the first philosophical textbook I had was a, a textbook by Bertrand Russell. Uh, and uh, Bertrand Russell, in the chapter on David Hume, gives a quote from Hume, and Hume says that the only real reason to do philosophy is because it brings enjoyment. So again, in this quasi-Epicurean fashion, uh, David Hume, in his uh, secular and also somewhat atheistic manner, says that the, the main reason to do philosophy is because it brings joy. And uh, to a very large extent, this has been my guiding light. And over the years, I have found that the most enjoyable way to do philosophy is to do it in conjunction with other people, in concert with other people. And so, uh, uh, kind of a bit too biographical, I'm sure, uh, something maybe I should not necessarily do, but you know, you'll, 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 you'll forgive this a little bit of uh, oversharing, let's put it that way. Um, but, you know, wrapping up this, uh, this lecture, again, colleagues, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining me, I really mean it. <laughs> your uh, uh, presence, virtual presence, make this uh, so much more enjoyable um, for me. So hopefully in the spirit of Epicureanism, we can continue, we shall continue to cultivate our garden, our philosophical garden this year and maybe even more importantly next year when you take your University of London exams <laughs> in political philosophy. So uh, uh, I suppose, you know, 
that's that. And uh, um, I hope you found this stimulating. I hope you found it enjoyable. I definitely found it tremendously enjoyable. And uh, um, I will see you in the seminars. And uh, until next time, again, the phrase, the phrase, and hopefully with every class you under understand this phrase uh, better and better. Uh, take care, take care, because as you, as you know now, you know, philosophy is therapy. Philosophy should be for the soul what medicine is to the body. And I, I hope, at least in some uh, uh, preliminary fashion, this course is helping you with that. Okay, colleagues, and uh, with, bed, with that, I bid you farewell, and I will see you in the seminars.